going to start First John and covering three books here today because two of them are the shortest two in the Bible and all written by the same author, which is the Apostle John. Not named in these as the writer. However, he is held to be the writer by the early church fathers who wrote uh, that always attributed to John. The other factor is that much of First John comes directly from the same exact words and phrases even of the Gospel of John which we know is written by the Apostle John. So because there is great connection in those books and because the early church fathers attributed them to John the Apostle, um, that is who we will uh, hold the authorship to be within the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The writer claims to be an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus Christ, which certainly reduces the amount of candidates that could have written it also. So he talks about the same kind of thing as John 1, he talks about in 1 John 1, the, this idea of this magnificent representation of God in the flesh in Jesus Christ. The setting and the date, no particular location is addressed um, or given because it's, it just talks about, it just dives in and begins talking about the various things that we're going to look at. However, uh, most scholars believe that John wrote this while he was stationed in Ephesus and that it was designed to be a circular letter to and throughout the churches. Certainly by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is just that, and we will study it today, just as if John had uh, sent it to us directly because it is it, it indeed um, designed for the church today. The key theme of 1 John is to correct false teaching. Guess what? False teaching, 2 Peter and Jude, we looked at last week. 2 Peter said, hey, it's come, and Jude said, it's among us. Um, most people will date this book after the Gospel of John, which makes sense because it has chunks of it in it, which means the date would be somewhere between 85 and 95 A.D., there are some that advocate an earlier date, but I don't think that makes sense. I think it makes sense to think of this being written towards the end of John's life, um, prior to Revelation, which will be the uh, last book that we study in order to finish covering out the, um, the New Testament and indeed the Bible that we began, I don't know how long ago. So the key thing, correct false teaching that had infiltrated the early church, and help people know for sure that they are children of the king. It is a very practical book telling the church what to do and the reasons behind the commands. Um, so we'll see those as we go. Unique features from Wilmington's Bible Handbook. First John contains no salutation or signature. It has no direct quotations from the Old Testament. It highlights three characteristics of God. He is light, he is righteous, he is love. Uh, John was known as the beloved disciple, but also as a son of thunder. This letter, with its gentleness and severi severity, justifies both names. So this is one of those where, while being gentle, um, John definitely was of the walk softly but carry a big stick kind of approach with his, with his gospel. So in this book, some of the other unique features, repeatedly throughout the letter, John addressed his readers as my dear children, okay? Uh, most likely writing as a more elderly gentleman back to the church. Yet he was adamant in warning of apostasy and in maintaining the division between the absolute light of God and the absolute darkness of the devil and his works. And then the last, it contains perhaps the Bible's best and most concise description of worldliness in chapter 2, um, verses 15 through 17. From the teacher's commentary, you see the outline there, invitation of joy, walking the light, walking in love, walking by faith. My outline will be different, which is typical. Um, and so let's dive into it. Chapter 1, let's read chapter 1 into the first part of chapter 2. It says this, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, 
and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have darkness with Him and yet walk in the darkness, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, then be righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also the whole world. So here we see, um, I, I hang this first point, how to have complete joy. How to have complete joy. Number one is have a relationship with the Father through the Son. Have a relationship with the Father through the Son. You want to have real joy in this life that is only going to come from and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, apart from that, real joy is not possible in a broken and dying world. Number B, have a relationship with those who saw Him in person and revealed Him to us which is the apostles and their doctrine of Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture. So in order to have real joy, we're going to have a, have a relationship with the Son through the Father, or with the Father through the Son would be a better way to put it, and we're going to have a relationship with the apostles and the apostles' doctrine, which is taught to us through the writings here in 1 John as well as the rest of uh, our completed canon of Scripture. Well then, the second point, how to have complete forgiveness. How to have complete forgiveness. Number one, we should walk in the light of truth. We should walk in the light of truth. And then number two is closely connected. We should confess sins when we wander into darkness. So when we deliberately, accidentally, or any other way end up walking away from the light of the truth and walk into darkness, we should confess our sin and know based on the power of God's word, if we confess that he is faithful and righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A lot of people have mistakenly taken John's discussion, which we'll see, of if you're born of God, you do not sin, and turned it into that you can have sinless perfection. Well, obviously that is not what he is saying because he says right in the first chapter that if we sin, we should confess, and he restores and forgives. So he obviously isn't talking sinless perfection is attainable. He is talking about that patterns of life should be changing and continually changing as we walk in the light of the truth. So how to have complete joy, how to have complete forgiveness, then my third point is how to fully abide in him. Look at verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says... I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So how to fully abide in him? First of all, we should be keeping his commandments. The person who says, I'm walking with Jesus and ignores his commandments is not walking with Jesus. All right? You're doing something else. But to abide in Christ is to walk in His revealed Word to us. Then the second point is found in chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, where it says, look at verse 9, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. So the second point is we should be loving our brother. Loving our brother. Now, it doesn't mean, obviously, in this context, only a brother in your family. It's referring to brother as in 
other believers. It is other people. We should be known for love. In fact, this gospel is loaded with love, love, love. Should be the distinguishing mark of people who are following the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then take a look at the third point in verses 12 through 14. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I, am, I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So how to fully abide in him, number three, is to trust in him and his word. We should be trusting in him and his word. Jesus said it, declares it to be the case. The apostles give the doctrine, the teaching, the truth of Jesus and how we are to interact with it. And we should absolutely trust in him and his word. That is the way we are going to abide in Christ. Then we are told in verse um, 15 through 24, Look what it says. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. I'm going to stop reading there just for time. The point is, don't love the world, don't love the world system, and don't love the world's leader. All right, who is the world's leader? The world's leader is indeed Satan, the roaring lion who is seeking whom he may devour, as we saw in Peter. This is talking about the world and its system. Does that mean, in context, that you must hate the Grand Canyon and you must hate the mountains of the West? Because that's the world. Don't be stupid. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But don't. Context here is the world and its system. It doesn't mean we hate the the creation God has created. That's that's silly. All right. This is about the system that we live in and its philosophy. So our philosophy in this world today is more and more and more and more diametrically opposed to the teaching of Scripture. Now I'm. 54 plus and this country has never been further from God in my lifetime than it is today all right I'm not going to speak for other lifetimes just talk for my lifetime never been further away and the trajectory is handbasket hell it is as fast as you can go on a roller coaster that only goes down that is the direction of the world in which we live so it is very easy for Christians to be influenced by the world and its system. So one of those things is the preponderance of teaching in our universities is truth is whatever truth is to you. If it's true to you, then it's true. What? So we have a whole generation of people who have been taught what is called postmodernism, been dubbed that, which says, if I believe that heaven is being placed into a spaghetti factory and eating all the spaghetti I want for the rest of my life, that is truth to me and therefore it's true. You understand the lunacy. There is truth and there is not truth. Mike and I were talking before you all got in here and we were talking about how, in fact, uh, Chris brought up, how are you going to do Revelation? And I said, well, in two sessions. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in two sessions. And we said there's a lot of disagreement about various things among different people. And then I made this comment. But not everybody's right. In other words, if I say it's one way and somebody else says it's another, we both may be wrong, is what Micah said. It's true, we mo both may be wrong. But not both of us are right. There is a right and there is a wrong. And the world we live in says, there is no right and wrong. Thus, you can have a vice presidential debate where abortion comes up 
and one candidate says, can't you just trust the women to make the decision? Right? Can't you just trust women to make the decision? But if you then said and interjected, okay, well, let's also trust the men to make the decision about whether or not they want to rape. We'll just trust the men for that. No. There's a right and there's a wrong. And killing the most innocent, the person totally unable to defend themselves, is a despicable act. All right? And incurs God's judgment. I believe we are feeling God's judgment even in the candidates that we are uh, having to face in this country. I believe it is part of the judgment of God how far away we have gotten from God and His truth. All right, so don't love the world, its system, or its leader. Number E, we should confidently hold to the truth while practicing righteousness. Confidently hold to the truth while practicing righteousness. Then, number F, we should recognize the great love the Father has given to us in making us members of His family. Look at that in chapter 3. So how great, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has his hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So here we see the idea of recognizing the great love that the Father has given to us in making us members of His family. Folks, I don't think we do this well enough. I don't think we roll around in the truth of the great love of God, how He takes people who are unworthy, who literally are spitting in His face, and reaches down, grabs a hold of us, changes us, regenerates us, and puts us into the family of God. It's driven by great love. And we must roll around in that great love in order to abide properly in Him. Then, we are told in uh, 3, 4 through 10, we should live lives of righteousness rather than practicing sin. Verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So these are some very strong words where John doesn't give any out, if you will. But that's why I addressed in the chapter 1, he obviously is not saying we are going to reach sinless perfection because he's talked about if we sin, we should confess and faith. the Father is faithful to forgive us of our sin. Yet this is talking about the ongoing trajectory of one's life. It should be that we are practicing righteousness when we are children of the King. We should live in light of that, which means we shouldn't go about practicing lawlessness, sinning against the God who has given us graciously the commands from which to have full joy. Okay, so this is some very hard words. So thus, when Wilmington said unique features, John tender, loving, yet son of thunder, he was known for bringing it, and he's bringing it right here, saying, how are you living your life? Are you known for living righteously, or is it other? By the way, this is a absolute slam against anybody who says, well, in the past, I said a magic bullet prayer called the sinner's prayer, and now that means I'm on my way to heaven, but I live like the devil all the rest of my days. Okay, It's foreign to Scripture. That's only uh, primarily Western American from the mid-19th century, the whole thing of pagan Christians. 
Scripture knows nothing of it. H, we should help and love others rather than hate or murder them. <laughs> now, I don't have time to read all the verses because we're covering three books, but love, just we'll look at the very first part because you'll get it there. Verse 11 of chapter 3, For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And that goes on to expand and talk about that. The bottom line is we should be known for helping and loving others rather than hating them, which is the equivalent of murder. Now, in Cain's case, the hatred for his brother actually did result in murder. But don't forget, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? He said, you say, hey, I'm, I'm okay, I've never murdered. And then Jesus goes, but have you ever hated your brother? And then everybody goes, hmm. Well, I guess uh, I am guilty of that. And then Jesus says, guilty of being murdered when you're guilty of that kind of hatred. So I guess we're all in trouble because Scripture says if you've broken one commandment, you're guilty of the whole lot. So when Scripture says, honor your parents in the Lord, for this is right, and we don't honor our parents by disobeying against them, I guess that makes all of us lawbreakers who are in serious trouble with the Holy God. Apart from Jesus Christ, we have no hope because we're all sinners. Scripture makes it clear. We should be helping and loving others rather than hating, which leads to murder. Then, how to know if one is from God, number four. How do we know if one is from God? Look at verse 24 of chapter 3. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So how do we know if one is from God or not? Now the one could be someone else or our own self. That's why I left it that way. How do we know if one is from God? Number one, he gives his children the spirit of God. All right, so the spirit of God indwells real believers. The spirit of God is given as God's gracious gift. And when Jesus says, I go, but I am going to send in my place, the Holy Spirit of God is that one who indwells believers and points to the truth of Scripture and the truth of Jesus Christ. Then, the second thing is, false spirits, false teaching, denies the proper teaching concerning Christ. It's uncanny how this works. I usually... It's been a while, but if I get a Jehovah's Witness on my doorstep, I immediately go to 1 John chapter 4 and usually send them scampering because they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. They manufacture their own Jesus, as do the Mormons, as do all false teaching. So, False teachers teach wrongly concerning Christ. How do they do it? Well, we're, number one there, we should always remember He is from God. Alright? He is from God. That means it's deity. Alright? The word deity meaning Jesus is God. Okay? So, what you have is, you have Jesus is either a little less than God in false religions, false teaching, or the second point is, he did come in the flesh. He is the God-man. So false teaching about Jesus is either going to deny his deity or it will deny his humanity. One or the other. So there are people that said, well, you know, Jesus had deity and then it left him while he was on earth. What? 
Yeah, because they don't want to have this God man, this unique, one of a kind, 100% God, yet 100% man. See, Scripture demands, I have, a Jesus who took on flesh and lives life perfectly and dies in my place. Okay? I must have a physical Jesus. So the false teachers who said this, they said, you know what, this, anybody who has skin is evil. Skin is evil. Therefore, Jesus didn't really come. It was just a manifestation as in we just thought we saw him. Kind of like Neil, what's his face, Degrassi, um, now is saying, and this is common now among the scientific elites, we don't really live in a universe in a world. It's an illusion of a universe in a world. That's the newest teaching that is coming from our smartest of the smart. It's not real. It's just an illusion. Okay? Understand how didn't, far away from the truth of God's word. God creates. Didn't and Aristotle it is believe that? Pardon me? Didn't that Aristotle believe that first? That we were we're like shadows cast on a wall. Probably. You're, but we're not actually in a real Plato. universe where the shadow. Plato. Plato. Yeah. I'm not a great Greek yeah. god mind, so I can't tell you for sure. But it's not this, a new teaching. It's ancient. Yeah. Yes. It's not a new teaching. It's ancient. It's just an illusion. This isn't real. Just an illusion. What Hinduism? That's what Hinduism teaches. Okay. Everything's an illusion. So false teaching wants to deny reality. This right here, skin and bones, God created. That's not the problem. Thus, when Jesus took on skin and bones, that didn't make him evil. The evil emanates out of where? <laughs> and out of the heart proceeds what is condemns man. So when, when Scripture talks about the problems of the flesh, it's not referring to flesh itself as evil. It's talking about what emanates from fallen flesh, which is the outpouring of a diseased heart. Thus, we need a new heart. We need the one who can regenerate us and make us new. So, false teachers will always be wrong on Jesus. They'll either deny his deity or deny his humanity. Mormons believe that Jesus and Lucifer were born from the same mother that came from a sexual union from God the Father and Mary, and they are Jesus, Lucifer, born of that union. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Okay, so you can call yourself the Church of the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. You understand? Okay? So, uh... Islam has reverence for Jesus as a prophet, but they totally miss out on the fact he's God. It's the wrong Jesus. It's a made-up one. You must have this right or you are wrong. Okay? There is no other uh, ground. Then, how to know if one is from God? We should be comparing what is said to the teachings of the apostles, which for us is the written word of God. We should be comparing what is said. Look at 4, verse 6. We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So when John is talking about listening to us, don't forget the New Testament is being formed. The letters are being written, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The, the speaking of the apostles as they taught the doctrine, the truth of Jesus Christ, is exactly what he's saying. We know the spirit of truth and of error. If you reject the word of God, you are not from God. Okay. Thus, when Brian McLaren writes a new Christianity, you can go, eh, no, wrong. It is not a new Christianity. So anytime somebody has a new perspective on, okay, I'm not saying new in and of itself is bad. But I like what Tony Morita says at Imago Day Church. He said, we're a relatively new church with a very old message. All right? The message has not changed. It is the same. It is Jesus, God in the flesh, descending from the Father, coming to heaven, living a perfect life, offering himself willingly in place of my sin and your sin, and indeed all who God has chosen in order to see the light and walk therein. All right, so where am I? D. D. 
Love for all will be a driving force in all that real followers of Christ do. Love for all will be a driving force. We don't have time to read all those passages, but trust me, it's loaded with it, that we should be loving one another. And loving, uh, a love should be a mark of the New Testament church. A few weeks back I said, forgiveness should be a mark of the New Testament church. Well, you know what forgiveness is wrapped up in? Love, all right? When your spouse says something hurtful and then asks for forgiveness of it, it is because of love that drives that uh, act of forgiveness and even the granting of it is wrapped up in love. Um, then he moves to chapter 5, verse 4. Look what it says. It says this. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this that he has testified concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you know that you have eternal life. Some glorious words of scripture. How to know if you have eternal life. First of all, A, you have faith in the Son of God. All right, that you have faith. You have confidence and trust in the Son of God. Number B, you have confirmation from the Spirit of God. All right, so the Spirit of God indwells true believers and gives that confirmation. Indeed, all of us should be able to testify to the fact I'm not what I once was because the Spirit of God will not let me be comfortable doing those things, saying those things, being the way that I once was headed. All right? This third point is confidence in the spoken word of God the Father. There should be confidence in the spoken word of God the Father. If, if God says this, all that, Jesus says, all that the Father has given to me, I will hold on to, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. We should have confidence in the God of the Word and all that was proclaimed. All right? So when I waffle, when I have a temporary lack of faith, what's the solution? For me to throw up my hands and wallow in self-pity? Or is it to go back to Scripture and read, this God is trustworthy. He is the one holding on to me. When he says it, I can trust it and believe it. We should have confidence in the spoken word of God. Number D, we should have total belief and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Total belief and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how to know if you have eternal life. If you ask a good Roman Catholic, can you know if you're on your way to heaven? They will respond, no. They'll respond, no. Why? Because it is a faith plus works. Anytime you have faith plus work system, works end up being the determining factor. Right? So their, their doctrine says it's faith plus works. No. It is faith and commitment and belief in Jesus Christ. I can have confidence because if it's dependent on my works, I can't be confident. I can't be. Because you don't want to know and see when I'm at my worst. Because it's not deserving of any of God's glory, right? Right? So understand, we can know because we have confidence in God and His Word and in fact in the Son and Jesus Christ. Then, how to live confidently in Jesus Christ. I believe the last part of this chapter, verse 14, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Let me just tell you how to live confidently in Jesus Christ. Number A, we should pray in the will of God and know that he hears. We should pray in the will of God and know that he hears. I think too often our prayers are nothing more than just 
like Santa and a wish list, rather than prayerfully praying that the will of God would be done in our lives, in our community's lives, and indeed in the world. All right? Praying for the, the advancement of the gospel. Praying for those involved in the advancement of the gospel. Too often our prayers are only, by the way, it's not wrong, but it's wrong if our prayers are only fix, give me, help, you, you with me? Um, when you look at the Lord's model prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So there is praise and prayer. Then it's, then after that, what's next? that praying that your will will be done. So praise of who he is, and then praying that his will, will be done is the very foundation of biblical prayer. Um, here we see praying the will of God and knowing that he hears our prayers. Number B, know that we are protected from the evil one. Verse 19 says, we know that we are God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. In verse 18, it says, He who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. So know that we are protected from the evil one. We are not living in the dualist world. The dualism said this, there's good and there's evil, and they're at war, and it's just, we don't know who's going to win. No, we have the victor in Jesus Christ. So whatever old theologian first said it, the devil is indeed God's devil. You understand what he's saying? The devil is under control of God the Father. You say, well, wait a second, the devil is seeking about who he Yes, remember what Job is, he's limited by God, but his scope is quite wide as to what God is allowing him to do in this present world. But it is indeed God's devil. This is not dualism, it is the one who has power over the devil is the one who is holding on to me. Therefore, I can live confidently in a fallen world. Then, know that we serve the true God is number C. And then I love how the thing ends. It seems disconnected, but it's not. Then it says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Okay, so that's how he finishes. You want to live confidently in Jesus Christ? Don't get distracted by idols. Okay? Don't get distracted by idols. Because the minute that you do, and you're distracted by something shiny, you lose sight of the real and the lasting. So if you think the new iPhone 7 is going to bring you ultimate happiness, you're wrong. It won't. Because it's going to end up being in like 12 months, 18 months, it'll be obsolete, and it'll be a real turd of a phone. Right? Because that's how idols are. They promise something and they don't deliver. Did I miss blanks? No, no, no. I'm just, um, does anyone ever think that maybe we don't have the whole letter of 1st John just because it doesn't have the typical sign-off, just sort of Stops. end. Yet no salutation either. No ending, no, I mean, so we, we got neither end of it. Um, and there isn't any speculation about it that I have heard. Um, so this is just like, there's times if you think about it when you jump right into something with your kids even, and there is no introduction or ending to it. It is, do this now. So that's kind of the, the tone of the letter. However, as we go to 2 John and 3 John, um, we're going to see in 3 John, there is a letter that was written that never made it to the church. So let's do that real quickly because we've got to cover two books in five minutes. All right? 2 John, the Apostle, is John, written shortly after the book of John. Key theme, love one another, but be discerning and don't provide love for false teachers who are traveling to the churches. All right? We have to read this. It's so short. I can say we read the entire book, and you can take credit for that. It says this, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, that you should walk in it. 
For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the, the, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. All right, so quickly, the commendation. This book starts with commendation. Number A there, it's given to the lady and her children. So the question is, is this an individual or is it a church? Well, the context at first would lead me to believe it's referring to a given woman and her children. However, what fights against that a little bit is verse 13 says, The children of your chosen sister greet you. Which would almost indicate the idea of using the children and the lady representing the church and another church and its followers. Here's what I want to say to you. It does not really matter if it was written to this single uh, family or if it was written to the church. It is to the church because of its inclusion in the canon. And in fact, the, the instruction is the exact same. So it's not critical to, and truthfully, I'm torn. Normally I've got an opinion, uh, and I'll tell you that I'm right and everybody else is wrong, and then jokingly say that might not be the case. This is one where it doesn't really matter, but I don't really know. Um, number B, she is praised for walking in the truth. She and they are praised for walking in the truth. And number C, they are encouraged to continue loving one another like Christ had commanded. So there's your commendation. But then the caution comes after that. The caution is this. False teachers are at work and will show up in the church. Thus, we see again from 2 Peter, Jude. Now we see it here in 2 John. The promise that many deceivers have gone out and have been assaulting the church from the very get-go. False teaching actually began where? The Garden of Eden. So it's not even new to the church. It's ancient of days because Satan came in and took the Word of God and distorted it and made it say something it didn't say in order to waylay mankind. Okay? So false teachers at work, how should we know? We should compare their teaching about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. All right, talking about Jesus coming in the flesh, this refers back to 1 John also, which is he did take on skin. He did, in fact, live. It was real. He is a historical figure who walked on the face of the earth. And two, compare their teaching with the instruction of Jesus Christ is what he tells this church or this lady in her household. The reason I think it, it's probably written to her, I lean that way more, is the idea of this was a woman who was graciously opening her house to bring the itinerant minister in to give them a place to stay and feed them and help them along their way, okay? Like Paul traveled and others did, um, she was gracious in this. If not her herself, the church itself was gracious in that activity, all right? So what is the caution? B, when it doesn't match up, when the teaching doesn't match up, do not receive these false teachers into your house as you end up, in effect, supporting their destructive ministry. You end up supporting their destructive ministry. Okay, so in brackets, I put this required discernment and involves being able to discriminate. All right, the reason I brought up those two words is because discernment is at an all-time low in, in the evangelical church. All right, so if somebody claims to be a believer, everybody goes, oh, great, Justin Bieber, he's a believer now. No, because he practices lawlessness, all right? I don't care what his hair-brained Hillsong church pastor says, oh, I'm, I'm Justin Bieber's pastor. Miley Cyrus also, good Southern Baptist, okay? Miley Cyrus said the sinner's prayer when she was 11 or 12, all right? She joined the Southern Baptist church. You want to call her a believer in Christ based on her activity? Foolishness. Discernment says you must use the scripture to discern whether something is right or wrong. And then you must discriminate. All right, discrimination is a word that today is, oh, you said discriminate. Yes, 
you're a fool if you don't discriminate, is what scripture is saying here. You must be able to say, I'm not letting this person in and supporting their ministry while I am going to continue to love and support real ministry activity. Okay? So you must discriminate in that in that mode. Yes? Does that mean you can't, like, like if a Jehovah's Witness comes to your house, you can't really yeah, I don't think so, Suzette. I think it's a great question. Um, so you have that person on the doorstep. Can you bring them into your house to sit down and have a discussion with them? I don't think this is discussing that activity at all. That is when you are actually trying to minister to them. You're trying to present truth to them. The idea would be if you then said, hey, I know you're driving around. Let me give you some gas money so that you can drive to some more houses and shed heresy. You, you with me? Uh, let me house you in my house overnight so it doesn't cost you a hotel room so you can continue to minister in your false ministry. That's, I think, what it's talking about. Okay? Good question. Third John, in one minute. The Apostle John wrote it, written about the same time as First and Second John. It continues to support and encourage true ministers of the gospel. So Second John said, hey, be careful not to let false teachers in and support them. Third John is, hey, continue to support real ones, <laughs> okay? In other words, support real ministry activity. The beloved believer is talked about first, which is Gaius. He was walking in the truth. That should be ABC. I'll fix that. Walking the truth, faithful in caring for fellow believers. And C, he was gracious in hosting itinerant ministers. Then there's the proud and obstinate believer is addressed in this passage, which is Diotrephes. He loves to be first, okay? I put church boss next to him. The church boss always loves to be first. B, rejects the clear teaching of put, putting others ahead of self. The teaching of all the New Testament is consider everybody better than you. Okay? C, he would not support traveling ministers of the gospel. And D, he would even intimidate others from not extending any help. So if you were helping somebody, he'd say, you, you're out. Okay? I mean, this guy's just like out of control. He had some authority, obviously, but I suspect this church wasn't exactly governed the way it ought to have been governed because this guy was waging war um, in the church. Then there's the exemplary believer given, which is Demetrius. It says, there was a good testimony from everyone. He was committed to and following the truth, and there was commendation from John and his people, even when he said, not as everybody else say good things about this guy, but we also can commend him. So we see a beloved believer, an obstinate, proud believer, and an exemplary believer in 3 John. So the instruction is, make sure and be supportive of real ministry. Whereas 2 John is, be supportive of real ministry, but by all means, don't support lousy, false ministry. So don't send money to people who are involved in false teaching. And if confused about it there or not, ask elders to give you direction on who should be supported and who should okay? All right, next week we are combined Sunday school with an update on Josh and Michael and, and Tom's travels. And so we'll be doing that downstairs. By all means, be here for that. Then the following week we'll do Revelation and then we'll finish Revelation the next week. So we'll do Revelation in two swoops. So next week combined downstairs, okay? Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to study these books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And Lord, we're convicted of, of the fact that we don't love like we ought to. Lord, we wander in darkness and, and sin against you. Lord, we are so grateful that this passage tells us that if we confess our sins, that you forgive us and cleanse us from that unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that you'll help each one of us to be discerning and to be um, diving into this word so that we know the difference between false and true. Lord, may you help us each to be involved in uh, supporting that true ministry and despising and discriminating against those who do not have uh, the, the proper uh, teaching in regards to the, the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious salvation. May you bless the service to follow. Lord, as Michael brings the message and music and all that we do, may it honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.